God dwells in you. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, giver of all good gifts, we thank you, especially this morning, for the great gift you give us when you give us to each other in the church and in the whole human family. Be powerfully present among us this morning. Help us to dream of new ways that we can come together, new ways that we can be present to each other and be present in your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So welcome. My name is Mike Kenman. I'm the rector here. My pronouns are he, him. If you're new to All Saints this morning or visiting with us and would like to learn more about things that are going on in this church, kind of be kept up to date with what's happening in the community, we have uh, green contact sheets near both doors. Please take a moment just to sign and give us your contact information. Uh, The restrooms are over there around the corner, so you can find those there. Uh, And the exits are right there. And there, I feel like I'm on Southwest Airlines or something. Um, There's also a welcome table on the lawn where you can pick up uh, a red welcome bag. It's got a card that you can give us your information on, has lots of information uh, about All Saints Church. Uh, At all times, we put our faith into action here at All Saints Church, and every week we pick one or two things to really give it some focus. Uh, This Sunday, we're putting our faith into action by signing a letter to members of Congress encouraging them to do everything that's necessary to meet the goals of the United Nations Climate Change Report. So please, please visit the action table uh, to sign the letter and get more information on the climate report. Uh, Also, the recommendations comparison chart for ballot measures is available on the action table, and information and you'll be able to register to vote is at the action table. So please uh, make sure you stop by the action table before you leave today. As always, our ministry here that we share at All Saints Church is supported by many things. It is supported by uh, incredible amounts of the grace of God, by the labor and life of everyone gathered here, and also by all of your generous financial gifts, Uh, and that includes those of you who are streaming with us online. So if you have already filled out your pledge card for 2019, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, If not, please do that as soon as possible. We're trying to get all those in. Uh, by the end of this year, uh, and, and as always, we just ask that you, you say your prayers and listen to God in prayer, have conversations with people that you make decisions about money with, uh, and then just dive in and just pledge what God puts on your heart, and, uh, and, 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 and we're excited about coming together this year and in the years to come. Uh, really excited about our forum this morning. Uh, the Right Reverend Diane Jardine Bruce is a suffragan bishop of the Diocese of Los Angeles, Uh, Bishops are signs and symbols of the unity of the church that is a unity that exists beyond the four walls of any specific congregation. It really is about a reminder that we are connected in amazing and profound ways throughout the diocese, around the country, and around the world. Uh, And we get to really explore and dream about what that means and what God has in mind for us when God kind of connects us with each other. And so I'm, I'm grateful that Bishop Bruce is on her visitation here and can share with us a little bit about things that are happening in the Diocese of Los Angeles. We can have a conversation together and maybe do a little dreaming. So would you please join me in welcoming uh, Bishop Diane Jardine Bruce. I'm short, okay. <laughs> And I was born and raised in New Jersey, so you're going to hear that. Good morning again. It is so good to be here with all of you. I thought this morning I would talk to you a little bit about kind of my ministry right now and what that entails and uh, talk to, and then take some questions from you. Does that sound good? Right. So I am the bishop. Uh, I have been the bishop in charge of multicultural ministries since I started uh, in June of 2010. And what that entails is uh, working with the ministry groups, um, Asian, uh, Black, Native American, Uh, or First Nations and um, Latino, Hispanic groups, and that is a big passion of mine. You heard me speak Spanish and Mandarin in today's service. Those are languages that I learned um, growing up and in college, and they are the reason why Bishop Bruno and then now Bishop Taylor has continued to tap me to do this work. It is an honor to do so, and um, it is the growing edge that we have here in the diocese. I will say that I'm also trying to learn Korean, but it's very hard. I will tell you, it, it, that might be the language that does me in. Um, 
so, so what's happening right now is we have a growing Asian population in the Diocese of Los Angeles, and we're working to meet the needs of that, of that burgeoning community. Last night, we had a uh, group called The Gathering that met, and that's a way to bring together Asian Americans into, into the church, into, to have conversations about religion. And what's interesting is uh, we started this because what we're seeing is Asian Americans are not necessarily coming into the Episcopal Church, but we're actually a great place for them to come into the church. What we're hearing from the Asian American community is that Asian Americans are leaving evangelical churches for three reasons. One, they want a place where they see women in leadership. Two, they want a place where they can deal with and talk about LGBTQX issues. And three, they want a place where they can doubt. The Episcopal Church is actually the perfect place for them, but here's the problem. Here's the problem. We are really good at welcoming people over 60. <laughs> and when you're a young Asian American, that just doesn't fit, does it? No. Um, and sometimes with our Asian American community, we don't know how to deal with them when they come in the door. We ask, we ask questions like, where are you from? And when they answer Nebraska, no, 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 really, where are you from? Um, which is, it, that's not the question that you ask, right? So we're actually going to be starting, it's, uh, starting this coming Saturday, an, a series of immersion experiences for congregations, leaders in congregations from around the diocese to understand different cultures within our diocese. So we're starting out with Chinese, uh, and that'll be this coming Saturday, and there's a group from All Saints, I'm happy to say, that's coming to that. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll spread it out through all of the other Asian communities that we have, because we have Vietnamese, Korean, Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, which is Cantonese-speaking, and Mandarin-speaking, and Taiwanese-speaking. So we've got a gamut here, which is really kind of wonderful. And the new expression that we're going, that we're working on right now, is South Asian, so uh, which is which is India, Pakistan, India, Pakistan based. Uh, my son actually is a Hindi, Urdu, Farsi scholar. He teaches at UC Berkeley. I can't get him to help me with this, um, but I've got Bishop um, Sami Azariah and his wife Kushnud Azariah who um, are helping us kind of start that ministry. So that's kind of where that, that piece of Asian ministry is. Um, we have 39 Spanish-speaking congregations in this diocese. Some are embedded within, like, like here at All Saints, some are embedded within a community that's already existing. And then we have some standalone Spanish-speaking churches as well. And they're going great guns, and we're very happy um, with some of the trajectory there. But again, not unlike some of the other communities, um, we're, losing, we're losing the 1.5, 2, and 3 generations out. So we're working on strategies uh, within the diocese to kind of attract them and bring them back into the church. Make sense? Am I talking too fast? Okay, good. Because I always worry about that, because I'm from New Jersey, and you get going, it's like, man, man, man. Okay. Um, <laughs> The, growing, the big growing edge I have right now is with our, especially our historic black churches. So this week, uh, we've got the Missioner for Black Ministries from the Episcopal Church uh, headquartered at 815 uh, 2nd Avenue in New York. He will be with us on Wednesday so we can reimagine black ministry in the diocese. And I'm very excited about that because it's, it's a very interesting um, phenomenon that we have because we have um, uh, we have descendants of slaves, we have African Americans, we have people from, from different countries within the continent of Africa, and we have people from the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean islands. And it's interesting the way they do not, they do and they do not blend, and the way they, the, the way they dance together. And so we're going to try to reframe the dancing of black ministry within the diocese. So say a prayer for me this week and say a prayer for all of us as we gather to do that. Um, part of the reason why we're doing that is the Diocese of Los Angeles will be the hosting site next year of the National uh, UBE Union of Black Episcopalians gathering here. And I believe All Saints is gonna be one of the sites that they're gonna be coming to. So the U, isn't that kind of cool? So uh, UBE president will be out this week also. So we'll do a site visit. So it's gonna be kind of a busy week. Um, so that's that piece of the ministry that I do. Um, I was also put in charge of stewardship and development when I was first made bishop, and I still have that 
underneath, you know, is, is my part of my portfolio. You heard a little bit about why my heart gets fired up about these things today in my sermon. And if you haven't been to the, if you have been, if you weren't at the nine o'clock and you're coming through the 1115, I'm not going to spoil it. Not going to spoil it. But I will tell you that, you know, I get fired up. I get fired, I get fired up. All right. So when Bishop Taylor took over, uh, as bishop in December of last year, he looked at me and he said, Diane, you were a banker for 17 years. And I said, yes, John, I was. And of course, he knew that because I was his area bishop before he became bishop. Actually, he, I had to explain to him how some of the bishop things work, which was kind of fun. So, so he's, you know, I kind of mentored him when he was coming through the process to begin with. I was his supervisor before he became ordained to the priesthood. And now I kind of did it a little bit again at the beginning of his tenure. That was kind of fun. So I like to, I like to say, you know, I, mol I molded him anyway. Um, so he said, well, I want you to take over finance. And I said, what? And so, so I took over finance. And we were blessed with hiring a new CFO. And we were blessed with uh, people coming together to help us reimagine the finances of the diocese. What that means is that historically in the diocese, the diocese saw one income and expense stream, which is the mission share fund budget. That's what everyone votes on at convention. But nobody saw what income was coming out of Corp Soul to fund mission and ministry or what mission and ministry items were funded by the corporation of the diocese. So with the help of people like your own Terry Knowles, uh, who sits on our think finance think tank, along with a uh, person that is a real estate expert, a person that is a tax expert, um, and an uh, um, insurance expert, and there's one, there's one more, why am I blanking? It's because I need water. Thank you. Um, Terry, who am I missing? You can't remember either? Oh, good. I'm, oh, good. Maybe it's just one of those moments. Do you want? So, so uh, anyway, but what's great about that is we've got, we have these incredible people that are helping us reframe how we look at things. So a few weeks ago, I sat down with our treasurer, Andy Tomat, who is just amazing. And um, Andy created a spreadsheet that looked at all of the funding sources that we have, and then we collapsed all of the mission and ministry into 10 areas. Pieces that we give out, pieces that we give, because remember, we have to give first. I said that this morning. That's spoiler alert for those of you that weren't at the 9 o'clock. Um, how we deal with the communities around us in terms of what we give and support community programs and how we keep the home fires burning. What does it take to run a diocese? So I spent uh, the better part of 90 hours loading all the data. So there'll be one report that comes out at convention so you can see for the first time as a diocese exactly how much it costs to run everything here and where the money comes from. So that's never been done before. And, um, and it will continue to be reported that way, and we'll continue to be working on making um, holistic, transparent, healthy decisions with the help of an amazing finance think tank and, and people gathered uh, to make the diocese as healthy as we can. Does that make sense? So that's been the bulk of my work. And um, because, because he gave me this extra piece but didn't take anything away, you see. <laughs> It's funny how that works. Um, but it's a holy work, and I actually love it, and it's, it's taxing a part of my brain I haven't had to use in a while. So I kind, of, I kind of like that. And it's wonderful to be able to see and report exactly what things are and what they're not. And um, so we're just, you know, spoiler alert for that. Wait for convention or the deanery pre-convention meetings. It'll all be kind of outlined there. We're also, oh, for the first time ever, we did something called narrative budgeting. So I thought if, if I'm going to be putting together a budget, I want to know what's, what, where people's hearts are. What are they excited about? 
what have they done this year? What, are they, what, are, what, did they, what did they do that worked? What did they do that didn't work, that they learned from? What are they looking at for next year and the years beyond, and how much money do they need for that? So what I told every department within the, dias, within the diocesan structure and all the program groups and commissions is tell me what your thoughts and dreams are. Tell me what you're working on. Let me know. I can't promise that I can give you everything but I really want to try to start looking at how we can move mission and ministry forward, but not do it in a vacuum, do it with the input of those that are actually doing the work. What a concept, right? And so, so to that end, people submitted all of their work, and it was beautiful. I mean, I, from things as short as little bullet points to, you know, one was about 18 pages. Um, it was a wonderful way to start to celebrate mission and ministry as it's happening in a new and exciting way. And so there's actually going to be a little sheet that you'll see at Diocesan Convention, and I hope it'll be available on the website, that, that you can see for each of these ministries where their funding sources come from, what their basically their, 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 their general expenses, and then the mission and ministry that they're doing and what they're excited about. So we're doing a one-pager for each mission or each ministry area, isn't that kind of cool? And then we're also gonna be doing some overall ones for the, those, those 10 buckets, those 10 expense buckets that I talked about. So that's been my, um, a lot of my work and a lot of my life these last few months. And it continues to fill me and make me very, very happy. So I have that kind of going on. Um, I do travel, I, I am on the board for the church pension group. So I do travel to New York for that. It's nice because I speak the language. Um, <laughs> when I go to Starbucks and when I go to Starbucks and order a tall coffee, I don't have to spell it. <laughs> so um, I also tra have traveled through Asia a lot um, because that's a lot of what our ministry or my major ministry is. And so I was earlier this year in Korea and the Philippines, uh, and I will go back again, uh, definitely in 2020, if not before. Um, we have a very strong connection with the province of the Philippines, or the province of the Philippines, and the province of Korea, uh, and we can we want to continue to make that grow. Make sense? Okay. Uh, I've talked a lot, and I've talked fast. Do you have questions that you want to ask? Anything you want to know about? Anybody? There's, there's some questions. Could you explain the uh, official position on the detainees, the immigrant detainees, and the children in cages? That is, um, as B Bishop Taylor, Bishop Taylor, Kenna McCarthy, and I have had long discussions about that and have written uh, against um, the, whole, the whole detainee, that whole, it's, it's abhorrent, it's abhorrent. Um, our presiding bishop has, has written against it and spoke out against it. We have written and spoke out, spoken out against it. Um, uh, our clergy, uh, especially in sacred resistance, have been very vocal in their protests. Um, the House of Bishops, when we met at convention, in, at general convention, all went out to a detainment, a detainment center. Uh, and what was interesting was one of the bishops, who kind of always gets lost anyway, got lost and went, went to an area he wasn't supposed to go to, and the detainees saw him, and because he had a group of people around him, because he's that kind of guy, and they wrote messages thanking, thanking the bishops for being there, and put it up against the window so we could see. And so the bishops of the Episcopal Church, the Episcopal Church is against very much against, and, and that was the big thing when I went to the Irish workhouses um, in, in Ireland uh, just a few weeks ago. When I visited and toured there, and one of the things that we were told, and we got to see some history of that, is that the minute, the entire family had to show up at the workhouse before they were accepted, and the minute they hit the door, children, the male children were put into one dormitory, females into a, female children into another dormitory. If you were a child under the age of two, you could stay with your mother, but the minute you turned two, you were in a dorm. And uh, parents were separated, male dormitory, female dormitory, and uh, oftentimes they never saw each other again. We keep on repeating history. 
that's a sinful history. It's got to stop. So, so there you go. Yes. It's on? Yes. Yeah. I'm an undercover Episcopal, I want to come out. <laughs> <laughs> I've known you for a long time, I know that to be true. Uh, your leadership is so contagious and I don't have a question, but um, I'm still reverberating from last night's gathering, uh, spirituality and music, organ and drum combo. That was quite a treat. Who knew that a Skinner organ could play jazz music? Oh my God. <laughs> I was fabulous. I, yeah, so I just want to continue to learn from you. And I've got a whole bunch of young Asian American who are wandering. So if you want to tap into my network, I've been teaching at Azusa Pacific University. And most of, more than 80% of uh, undergrad students are unchurched. So I'm going to set up an appointment with you after 11. Good. And Mike? Yeah, you bet. All right. The three of us, okay? Anybody else? Oh, and then right there too. Yes, David Randall. Uh, looking at the dynamics of how the population of the church is changing and how the finances are changing, what are the areas of income that have shown the largest increase and the largest decrease, and what are the areas of expenditure that are projected to be diminishing and those that are expanding most significantly? And what are the, the overall impacts of these changes on our ministry? What, what we're seeing is that um, people with significant endowments are faring well, and uh, uh, people that don't have endowments are, are potentially uh, if, if nothing else happens, and if they don't change the way they're doing ministry right now, um, they can be in danger. So there's a couple of, there's a couple of strategies. One is uh, Bishop Taylor created an entrepreneurial think tank where people involved um, in entrepreneurial uh, ministry throughout the diocese, about 30 to 40 come together. Uh, uh, I think it's once a month, and, and I've been to a couple of them. What's wonderful about that is people are exchanging ideas because there's many things that can happen to shore up a congregation uh, that, that doesn't take a lot of money to start but, but brings, starts to bring income in in new and exciting ways. The other piece that is really problematic for we Episcopalians is that especially in Southern California with the changing demographic around us, we oftentimes find it difficult to welcome someone that doesn't look, look like and talk just like us. And while we think we might be welcoming, um, oftentimes uh, a person of color will be off put. And so it's trying to help people develop sensitivity into what this looks like. Um, the way that manifests itself is very interesting, even just basic misunderstanding about the differences within Chinese culture. Uh, an example is I went to a school, uh, one of our Episcopal schools, which remain nameless, and they were having some exchange students come over from mainland China. And they, they said to me, Bishop, we couldn't get the Chinese families here to take in these students. They refused. And I said, um, let me guess, the families that you approached, were they from Taiwan? Yes, Bishop, and I said, do you understand the history? Do you understand? I mean, but this is just basic stuff, right? This is just basic stuff. And so, so if we can't, part of my cultural immersion things that we're doing for all of our ethnic ministries, and I hate the word ethnic because, because we're all one in Christ Jesus, right? Didn't we, you know, Galatians 3.28, if you don't know it, and if we don't memorize scripture as Episcopalians, we don't. But that one, everybody should know because you're going to whip it out of your back pocket whenever anybody says to you, especially as a woman, you can't teach a man. Oh, Galatians 3.28, right there. There is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you're all one, well, guess what? Anyway, so I get fired up. Okay. So what... Bishop Taylor and I and Canon McCarthy 
are trying to do is relook holistically at the way mission and ministry happens, not only with how we invite and work with changing neighborhoods and demographics, um, but how we can use what we have to actually grow the church in ways that we haven't grown before. What we know is there's no more brand loyalty in the Episcopal Church, so it's, it's having mission and ministry that addresses the needs of the community around us that attracts people to us. Does that make sense? Con and I can tell you this, I've done about 45, no, more than that, 65 walkabouts for congregations I'm directly responsible for. And those congregations that are dying are the ones that are totally closed in on themselves. They have no Christian education, they just come to church on Sunday, they think they're friendly, and they don't understand why people don't come there. Congregations that are growing, that are becoming more and more financially stable, are ones that looked around their community and they're providing programming that reflects and meets the needs of the community around them. So that people feel that the church is part of them. So that's, so we're, we're taking it, we're trying to, it's like a diamond that we keep on finding all these facets that we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, deal with. You're welcome. And there was a question right there. There's a, Terry's got the microphone for you. you know, uh, is this thing on? Okay. You know, I, I really don't know how to phrase this question. I, I'm just struggling. But um, in this current political climate, you know, a, lo a lot of us are really struggling, really struggling uh, with anger and despair. And um, I used to be politically active. You know, I mean, I was out there carrying the signs and all this business. I just, frankly, don't have the energy or the inclination at my age to do that anymore. And, I mean, and so I struggle to find another way. And at this point in my life, I just see the answer is not simply some sort of political thing, it, but it's spiritual. It's the only thing that sustains me. And I'm just wondering if you could comment and give us your personal wisdom on sustaining ourselves and uh, keep believing the sun is going to rise tomorrow. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you know, whenever, whenever my days have felt dark, um, I rely greatly on prayer and sometimes uh, even when I pray morning prayer and it's not working for me, I'm still, I'm still not do it's still not doing it. And I have one prayer that I pray and I'll share it. Um, and I pray it in the morning and, and I'll tell you what I say when I, when I go to bed, when I'm having this kind of similar patterning. Lord, help. Just help. Let me see joy. Let me see some love. Let me see your love and joy. I need that today because it's too much. And God is gracious and God is good. And there's always something that happens where I see the inbreaking of God's love and grace. And I know that no matter how dark it gets, the world will turn and someday we'll be well. At night, and this is actually every night, it goes something like this after night office. Lord, it's been a long day. My body's tired. My brain is fried. I don't have anything more to give right now. Please hold my hand, Lord, and stay with me just a little while more so that I know when I wake again, you will be there as you always are at my side, loving me 
even when I don't feel lovable, loving me through all the ups and downs, just loving me. And that helps me. Maybe there'll be other words for you, but that helps me. Um, when I was working on all those spreadsheets, my prayer was, Lord, please do not let me have loaded the wrong data on the wrong spreadsheet. <laughs> And if I did, Lord, tonight would be the night to show me in a dream <laughs> so I can go back in the morning and fix it. See, I, I believe that prayer is a constant conversation with God. And if you're not living, if you live your life as a prayer, and it's not easy to do, but once you get it, it's like zazoom, right? If you can live your life as a prayer, then there's nothing that you can't face. And here's the deal, Samuel Shoemaker said, prayer might not change things for you, but it'll change you for things. Prayer might not change things for you, but it'll change you for things. And that's what I'm gonna ask you to do, is just keep praying. And of course, vote. <laughs> you know. What else, this is fun. Um, I, oh, there's, we have one over there. We have another, we have another contestant. <laughs> oh, my dog? Oh, no, not Basil. <laughs> Basil. I'm just curious, you mentioned how difficult it is for you to learn Korean. Can you expand on that? Seeing as you are fluent in Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so uh, I grew up around the corner from a Chinese restaurant in, a, in, New, in Proquanic, New Jersey. And if I wanted to play with Lee Song after school, I had to help in the restaurant. And her father would come running after us, wielding, wielding a cleaver, screaming in Cantonese. So you figured out what he was saying or got out of his way. And so that's where I learned all my food terms and all my dirty words. <laughs> and so, um, and then uh, I learned Spanish in high school. And when I went to UC Berkeley, I started out as a pre-med major, but I flunked chemistry and decided it was a sign from God. You know, I needed to, could not be a doctor, should not be a doctor. So linguistics was always easy for me, so I majored in linguistics, so I studied French, German, Spanish, Japanese, um, and, and uh, I took community Cantonese, and then I took Mandarin to learn how to read and write. Spanish was in there too. Spanish, Japanese, French, German, yeah. And um, when I took Mandarin, I kept everything nicely compartmentalized, all those languages. When I took Mandarin, everything skewed. So that it was like my brain said, that's the last one. <laughs> now, I know a little bit of Korean. I know enough to be a danger to myself and others. And I can actually get around Korea quite well on my own without anybody helping me. Um, although I don't recommend that in the train stations. No, oh no. I've gotten myself lost in the train station, but I always find somebody to help me. Um, so somehow, Korean is not sticking in there. Food is, I love Korean food. <laughs> Actually, I have not met a cuisine I don't like. <laughs> um, and since my, since my son is a Hindi, well, here's my other thing. My son is a Hindi Urdu scholar. He also speaks Farsi, so he teaches Urdu language and literature at UC Berkeley. And, you know, not that I'm proud, okay? <laughs> and so my big worry when he and his wife have a baby is that I'm gonna have to learn Urdu. Hindi or do. Um, and I probably will get through that because I'm gonna have that grandmother instinct going for me. Um, but my husband who cannot even speak Spanish, he's dead meat. He's dead meat. Yeah, so, so I think that that's it for me that I just got, there's too much going on in there. There's too much. And even, even, even when I do bilingual services, I do trilingual services sometimes. And I, do, I did a couple of times a trilingual sermon Trust me, that's like a two Advil, you know, two Advil event because by the time I'm done, I don't know where, you know, I don't know where I'm going. So, yeah, but I think that that's the reason. Sir, you have a question? Thank you very much for coming. Just a sidebar, I'd be curious about your husband's laundry ministry. Oh. Um, he and, a, it's really funny, he and a young man named Christian Kassoff um, uh, 
started like a little community house church when I became bishop. And so uh, he says, can I do this? And I said, well, I'm not the diocesan, but I think you, sh- you, uh, you know, anybody can come together to pray. What do we care? And so, uh, uh, well, I didn't say it quite like that. I was nicer to him than that. Um, but they were looking for a project to do, and they discovered laundry love, which anybody can do. So basically what they, and it's a, it started in Ventura. It's not a religious organization at all, but religious organizations have started to do this because what it is is you work with a local laundromat and you make an agreement with the laundromat owner to take over the laundromat for a night. You put up flyers or go door to door in neighborhoods of need, and we all, we all have neighborhoods of need, and you um, get residents to come and you, uh, you raise money through the church or through, you know, through fundraising, for, especially for the first ones. Um, you get the quarters that you need to do the machines. You don't give the guests the quarters. They've learned that. Um, and you get, you get the soap, you get the dryer sheets, and you treat people as they come in as your welcomed and honored guests. And you help them get their laundry done. Um, they have, I think we, he, it started in Huntington Beach, and I think that there's 10 or 11 of them now running in the diocese. And he and Christian go and help people get them started when they want to start. Stephen finds Jesus there in ways that I can't even tell you. He comes home absolutely physically exhausted, but he can't sleep because he's just so full of the love of God and Christ when he does it. Um, he, they, hear, they hear people's stories, families of five living in a van, um, families of four living in a car. Uh, they've, we've paid, I've paid out of my discretionary fund for um, a mother giving birth to stay in a hotel um, because she was living in her car. And so this is the kind of stuff and ministry that they do. Um, and it's not, just, it's not just for people that are homeless, it's for the working, poor. You know, families come that are working two and three jobs that, you know, $40, $50 to do your laundry, that's a lot of money. And so that's what Laundry Love is, and it's a fantastic, fantastic ministry. Oh, and they, um, now they serve food. I mean, they, they, they usually serve a meal, at least the one in Huntington Beach. He also partnered, a couple of years ago, he went to the Open, open Mosque Day, and the head of outreach for the, for the mosque, he is now best friends with my husband. And so the mosque comes and helps them. Uh, the members from the mosque come, and they actually bring the best food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the men from the mosque bring the best food. Right, and there's one in Pomona, and um, I think one in Oxnard, too. Yeah. Oh, and one in San Clemente. Anybody else? So, I'll ask you a question. Yes, ma'am. So, there is this notion that, uh, so each parish is, uh, my language, assessed a certain amount of money, percentage of the operating budget, right? For the diocese, is mm-hmm. that more or less Yes. Right? Well, it's not, it's mission Where does the money go? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, The Mission Share Fund pledges uh, go 100% to the Mission Share Fund budget. The Mission Share Fund budget historically has uh, been used to especially fund, one of the biggest items in that budget is uh, monies to help mission congregations and some aided parishes. So um, uh, especially mission congregations, that's where the bulk of that goes. It also goes to other ministries within the diocese and also to, su- to support the, the work of the diocesan staff itself. Does that make sense? So there's an HR person, there's communications, things like that. Um, whenever you look at the Mission Share Fund budget, there's actually pieces of that that don't get, uh, pieces of diocesan staff that aren't paid for out of that budget. And that's what we're gonna be showing. Um, actually, pieces of it might get paid out of corporation sole, pieces of it might get paid out of the corp- corporation of the diocese, and there's different reasons for that. But this will be the first time at, um, at our convention where I'm actually gonna be showing everybody what everything is. So Mission Share Fund is one, ple- one source of income. It's a big source, but it's a source of income for the diocesan operations and for us to be together as family. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for listening to me. Okay? Thank you.